you. So basically, we hear a lot of time that people are talking about very hard to find talents, right? Then we also hear a lot about that the middle age worker and the new workforce cannot find job. Something is wrong. Something is wrong because the tight labor market has an oversupply of unsuitable candidates. And if you were to imagine that why are we having to import all the talents from all over the world to attract them to come here, it's because we can't produce them ourselves. And it's not because of the birth rate. It is the because if it was the birth rate, then all these unemployed would already be employed. The problem is the educational system. Our educational system is incompatible with the market industry needs. Imagine that all the CEO and board members, the C-level suites are mostly foreigners, and the economic development is upset about this and say, why can't the locals go and fill up all these places? It's because the educational system is a conformist educational system right from kindergarten. And you were told to be efficient and to be packed on a grading system which is very proud that we uh, top scorer in the PISA score, the PISA. This PISA score measurement system is outdated and it is used as the tool to be so proud today and this is the problem. With the age of robots, AI, with all this technology moving so fast, human being can only try to be a better human. He cannot try to be a better robot. Yet the educational system asks you to be a better robot, which you can't. You just simply can't because what the robots can do must be something that the robots will be employed to do. Employers love automation, love, predictability, don't like employees who has moods, quarrel with colleagues, couldn't get along, resign, join competitor, ask for more pay, has off days, don't work 24 hours. Of course, they prefer the robots. Now, what you need to do is to actually become a very good human being, which means that you can do those things that the robots cannot do which is to create, to be curious, to have courage, to have compassion, to love, to have commitment, to take ownership, to be collaborative, to have humility, and to be calm, not to have outbursts. And then you have to have gumption, you have to have this kind of skill, which is soft skill. Then you can survive the future. Because with courage, you can learn very, very quickly the technology. You can understand the essence of technology and then apply it. Whatever you are short of, you can go to school and learn. You can Google. But if you are afraid, you become negative and you cannot adapt to the new situation. And that is why PMATs at midlife got fired, lost their job, and cannot find new job because they cannot reskill, because they don't have the curiosity, courage, compassion of themselves, and they cannot reinvent themselves. And then they enter into depression, and then it becomes a social problem. Then you have mental health issue. Why? Mental health issues happen when you cannot cope. If you are calm, if you are always reinventing yourself, you don't have this type of problem. You will always be employed. What is 
a job in the future. The job in the future will be largely a gig economy. Companies will need a few core staff and all the rest will be staff on demand. So if they need somebody, they call somebody, they do it for a period and then they disband. Just like Hollywood, just like making a movie. If we have a project that requires female star and uh, extras and cameraman and sound man and producer and director and scriptwriter and props people and fashion cosmetic people, I will call up all this talent to do that one film. It might take me two years to finish the film and then I'll pay everybody and I will disband. And the people who I will call will be suitable for that film. And they have to be very good sound men, they have to be very good script writer, they have to be very good in everything. And then your peers will say, let's keep calling that guy back because he's so good, right? So the ones that nobody call you, you don't have a job. So how do you make yourself all the time relevant, all the time available, uh, and, and, and maybe you are fully booked, and then you are paid even more, but you are actually having a full-time job, having it, the gig economy. But if nobody call you, there must be something wrong with your skill or your soft skill. Your hard skill could be very good, but you couldn't get along with people, you're always quarreling with them on the set, and so you lose the job. So soft skills are so important. And why is it that our Ministry of Education does not want to teach you soft skills? Because the bureaucrat says, I can't measure it. Soft skill is hard to measure. It becomes unquantifiable. And so when the school says, if I teach hard skill, I can measure, I can give marks, and the parents cannot come and say, why are you saying that this child is kinder and that child is more courageous and that child is more creative than my child? I'm going to write to the minister and get you into trouble. So the principal, the teacher say, oh, I'm going to forget about the arts lesson, the creative lesson, anything that I don't know how to quantify in hard measurement, I'm going to not do that. So how do you create a workforce when you do not allow experimentation, you want exactly the right answer? It's called a quality control business, which is mechanical. Do it right the first time. Innovation, you never do it right the first time. You do it until you get it right. In fact, what is right is you do it until it works. So if we keep on having do it right the first time, we create robots. Now, it's very convenient for the markers, the principal, to say, I've done my job. But we create a conformist culture that makes us very efficient, but unable to take out the job that the HR people, the company, the industry is needing. Now, what is the biggest industry today that is still unserved? There are 4 billion people earning less than eight US dollars a day that nobody see them as customer. This, we call it the base of pyramid people. This is a huge marketplace that people ignore because they say they have no money. Why should we serve them? So they keep on competing with the top of the pyramid, the middle class and the rich, until they couldn't find any more customer because the big company and the fast company, they are eating up the market share. You used to see shopping centers with all different products. Today, you go to any shopping center in the world, it is the same product. You see H&M, Starbucks, McDonald's, Zara. Every shopping center in the world has been commoditized. Now, where is your place? If you go to the 4 billion poor, the farmers, the, um, the uh, fishermen, the slum dwellers, these are your next marketplace. If you want to 
get them to be your customer, you increase their value addedness of their produce. If they are producing chili, you move the chili to chili sauce, you have 100x. Five cents chili become five dollars. Coffee beans that you drink coffee five dollars, but the coffee bean come from East Timor, and the farmers get five cents. From coffee bean to the cup is 100 times the price. If you see how to increase new customer, just be more direct, cut all the middlemen, bring them into the marketplace to increase their income and value addedness by 2x, 3x. It's so easy. They earn roughly two and a half dollar US a day. You can move it to five, six dollars just by value adding them. Then all this sustainable development goal and all that will be solved because the moment the poor get money, they can solve the problem. So what do we do now? We created a school of gumption and we created, uh, I have two colleagues over here, we created this school of gumption to teach the six C, curiosity, Courage, compassion, commitment, collaboration, and calmness. We need to create a new kind of educational system which augment the hard skill and to teach them how to question. Of course, politicians don't like people who question and therefore they would prefer the citizens who are voters to be non-questioning people and then they bring in the foreigner who are questioning people but don't vote. Therefore, this system cannot sustain. Eventually, we have to have a little bit more tolerance and then we will have people who can contribute new ideas. And I hope uh, you guys can uh, join me uh, to build this school because it is still a new concept. But the important thing is that the educational system is so old and so archaic that if we do not reinvent ourselves, eventually we will not have a, a new future in the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Yeah. Uh, please welcome conversation starter Gobinath G, Director of Brainwave Training, and panelist Emma Go, Yale and US undergrad. Um, Gobi's training and consultancy company has conducted various customized programs and executive coaching sessions for MNCs in Asia. He particularly enjoys working with young, aspiring talents, and he believes that every person has potential for greatness, and it's a matter of finding and grooming it for future growth. If you think of a change quotient, think of Emma Go. Emma's modus operandi always includes the element of meaningful disruption so as to rejuvenate processes and find renewed purpose. Emma is a second year urban studies major and heads her school's women in tech club. I'll uh, just let Jack uh, take this away. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gobi, take sorry. this away. Thank you, so Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Late in the evening. Good to see all of you. Thank you for coming and staying on. Uh, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Emma, for joining. Well, we heard a lot today about AI, about technology, about human DNA for recruitment, about being a human being or a robot in the gig economy. So perhaps I should invite the young lady to say a few words whether she is a human being or a robot for the future. Emma. So, hi everybody, my name is Emma. I'm a second year undergraduate at Yale and US. Um, coming here today, I, I don't really think I'm, I'm in a really good position to talk about like um, which industries young people are look, looking forward to, what type of skills that you have. But like, personally, I'm here with some, um, I had some interesting conversations with my friends about like the, their hopes, concerns, and yeah, a lot of questions about the future. So I come here today with more questions and answers. And going back to your question about whether I'm more of a human or a robot, because um, cause I'm majoring in liberal arts and whenever someone asks me like, so what is liberal arts? I get a bunch of answers. Some, some people say, oh, do you do like graffiti? Or do you do like, um, yeah, you know, like just um, architecture or just painting and stuff like that. Yeah, so 
um, I think to say that um, I'm a robot is pretty, yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit contrived, but yeah, I, I guess I'm just more human at this point of time. Of course you are indeed. Thank you, Emma. Well, in my life, uh, I was in a corporate before for about 30 over years, then came into consultancy and training for the past three, four years. And I've experienced going through many companies as like what Jack was saying. The technical skills are easily acquired. You can go and get pick it up. What was missing really was soft skills, really soft skills. And many CEOs and senior managers, when they recruit all the young talents, where we go in, what we are doing is we actually trying to train them, trying to instill some soft skills about collaboration. How do you manage conflict? How, it's all about leadership. What sort of leadership are you going to have? And today, what the CEOs are demanding is all the young talents coming in, they want to fast track them. So we have something called bite-sized learning, and we got this sort of five-month intensive program we, which we put through these young people so that they come up to speak quickly on the soft skills. Do you think it's easy? Of course it's not easy, you know? But that's when we come in to do coaching and all that, which goes on for years, of course. You know, we take on people and we just coach them and coach them. And then what happens? After a year or two, these young talents leave. They go somewhere else. And the CEO comes and says, what happened? What happened is all this training, you know? These people leave. So what happens? So why do young people keep moving? Is there anything you can share with us? <laughs> I said, we're talking about jobs and careers and futures. Of course, Jack has already shared. I'll talk about more of the middle age, but the young people. Well, I guess because um, in, in institutions of higher education, young people are constantly sold this narrative that you can do anything. There's a whole world out there for you to explore. And also because with um, social media and all, you see like young people creating change. And then you see like amazing officers like Google and Facebook. But then, um, yeah, based on like the interactions and conversations that I have with my friends, when they enter the workforce and then they realize that, you know, you have to start from the bottom up, you have to do the mundane duties, you know, you have to listen first before actually proposing a solution. And then after that, some people wonder, oh, have I been like left out from this narrative? Have I been excluded? And I guess that's when some sort of like disillusionment sets in. Yeah. So I guess it's just this um, kind of like divergence between like expectations and reality. Thank you for the Emma. Yes, you're absolutely right. Some of the companies we have worked with, the young people are saying the promotion is too slow. We can't move up faster than we want to. They want to have speed. And they said there's this layer of people sitting up there who don't move at all, who have been there for the longest time. So how do we move up if they don't even retire, if they don't even leave the organization? And although we're having problems in the Singapore economy at this point in time, it's like Jack was saying, that uh, the PMETs are not reskilling themselves to taking on new challenges and new jobs. But at the same time, their organizations, they can't move the young people up faster. And this is a case in point. Uh, in fact, if I go into in the region, when I worked at, with companies in Malaysia and out in Bangladesh and India for the matter, the same issue is there. So what do the people do and how we can move the young people up? That is something we have to ponder. And what do you think about that, Jack? I think that uh, people are pinching each other's staff because there's a short supply. But if you train them according to what the industry needs, then there will be enough supply. But you didn't. You train them not according to what the industry needs, but you train them on, uh, for example, I went to school and I learned the Pythagoras theorem. I've never used it. Sine, cosine, log, tangent. What is this all about? They are teaching us for the sake of marking us. So the entire educational system has become a Marx factory. And the whole purpose is not education, but Marx. And therefore, we create another new industry called the tuition industry, which we pay $2 billion to pressure cook our children and to get them marks. And every year, PSLE, O-Level, there will be one or two of them who jump off a building to kill themselves because of this pressure cooker system. It makes no sense. It is an educational system that kills people physically but also mentally. 
and it kills their self-confidence. Now, every single person is multiple talented. She could be talented in arts plus science plus something, but she may not be talented in history or geography. Now, they say, no, I'm sorry. You can be talented in anything, but because I have to be fair, I cannot measure you individually. I have to measure you according to the same measurement, which is, is your sine, cosine, and tangent very good? And if not, then you fail. I'm sorry. And I was one of the person who failed everything in O-level, but in society, I turned out to be not too bad. So why am I marked a failure? The system is a failure. The system is the failure. But all our people are going through the system. I've got three young gentlemen in my family, my boys, they are in the 20s. They, one is graduated, tried to look for a job, took a long time before he got a job. Went through many interviews, electronic interviews, by the way. <laughs> it's not one-to-one -one interviews. And, and they said that uh, they can't find a job match. So what's a job match? So what do the young people need to learn these days? So what do you think your learning is relevant for the future, you think, Anna? So hearing Jack talk about like, how the system kills you both mentally and emotionally it was actually quite worrying, and, and I'm even more thankful to be like, alive today. But I guess um, going through a system from like, PSLE, O-levels, and A-levels, and you know, enduring like, the, some, sometimes like, the drudgery of the system, I realized that um, there are some benefits in certain ways. Like it, Mm, for for example, like I guess I guess the system kind of gives you the the hard skills, but at the same time, um, I guess for young people they need to complement it with um, like uh, extracurricular opportunities or out school opportunities. And I guess one possible um, method that I have been exploring and talking to people about is actually mentorship. And I and I guess like from a very early age, uh, even like secondary school, mentorship with um, professionals and industry experts. Um, can be very helpful because it gives you like um, yeah you can benefit from their hindsight yeah and I guess because if I mean the system does have it as has its flaws but I guess like as a student myself I mean I'm in the system I'm kind of trapped inside but I guess to make the most out of my experience is to complement it with other you know out of school experiences so that you both have like the hard skills and the soft skills and then when you leave the education system you know um, you won't feel like there's this really big like chasm between what you learn in school versus what they need in the workplace. But just taking on point what Jack was saying, whatever you've learned, do you think you can get a job or a career for the future? Or will it be the same as you get older and older? How do you see it? I guess doing liberal arts now at this point of time, the most common question I get from people is that, um, can you actually get a job next time? Because what we do in liberal arts is a lot of like literature, humanities, and some sciences. And then, um, but I guess um, in recent in recent years, when I've been talking to like people in the workforce, um, there's a shift. Like em I see like a shift in employers to they kind of appreciate the the soft skills a bit more. And I guess like in the past, there was this debate whether um, people should hire like generalists or like specialists. But I realized that um, more enlightened employers now they, they kind of moved away from this debate, and they're saying that like you know we need both. We we need people who have both, and. Um, yeah, and I, I feel that um, yeah, and I feel that like with the current skill sets that I have, I mean, I'm lacking in some ways, but I feel that the education system in my school is pretty okay, and I, yeah, I don't think I well, um, I think finding a job um, probably won't be as much of a challenge, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. But as Jack was sharing with us, today we must become like actors or specialists in what we do. And from my trips around companies around the region, I think companies are moving towards, they're looking for specialists in their role. We talk about agile mindset, we talk about being flexible. So if one, say for example, studies to be an accountant, will he finish his career as an accountant or something else? Question mark. I think in today's society, that's not possible. So how can one become a specialist? What do you think? Sir? I think a specialist uh, job is very dangerous. Um, for example, if you're an accountant, uh, eventually the AI will be able to do all the accounting, and then you will be the one who judge and analyze 
uh, whether these numbers are actually reflecting the talent quality of the staff and you go outside the numbers and you say, hey, there's a HR problem in this performance because somebody is not doing a job very well and he needs skills training or he needs to be replaced and most of his job is going to the, uh, into the AI. Now, if you are a lawyer, as you know, now Singapore uh, SMU has already invested $8 million on the AI uh, law software. So what is going to happen? A lot of lawyers are doing stereotype thing like, you know, conveyancing, transferring a property. You cost so much money, ping, that you go to AI. I think it costs only $10 now rather than $10,000. Now, if you're going to do a precedent case, for example, you have to search case law and you say this is a precedent judgment and all that. The AI does that. Normally, this thing will take you five days. Now it takes you two seconds. And so those workload will reduce and reduce and reduce and judgment will come very, very quickly. But the lawyers will not be needed. So the lawyer will need to be very, very clever to do this. And this goes together with the doctors also. Tomorrow, you do not need to see a doctor. You just have to get your diagnostic through your phone, through uh, biometrics. And worse than that, the number of people sick will be very little because there will be predictive health and the preventive medicine and it goes even up to your DNA and they can remove those things from your stem cell. That means you actually will have lesser and lesser and lesser need for human resource in the traditional sense. But then these people who are going to be very important are the ones who are creating new solution and what is their skill? The skill has to be able to find out where are the problems. And if you can find a problem, you must be so happy. Because a problem means that it's not solved, means it's unserved customer, means it's an opportunity, and you convert into a business. Now, I want to test this young person, right? <laughs> now, would you, uh, if you come and apply a job from me, and I say, oh, I have plenty of jobs, but you can only be paid if you earn money for me. You come to my place, you can work for a long time, and if you're not producing money, I don't pay you. In fact, you should produce money for your salary plus a surplus for me. Because that's what an employer is supposed to do, right? Why should I pay you? No, I only employ you because you pay me. You understand? When you work in a company, you pay employer. Employer never pay you. If you have to be paid by the employer and you don't pay the employer, then you will be fired. This is traditional, but now we are talking frankly, right? In the past, the employer don't say it like that, but actually, would you come to me and I say, I will train you everything to make money, and once we make money, we share. Will you take this job? I guess it will depend on like how much you already want a job, and if you mention that you're a trainee and you invest in my training in the long term, then why not? So in the next three, four, five months, six months, you never earn any salary. I'll give you some food. But uh, when you start to make money, you start to make big, or you are lousy and you make nothing. And I can employ tons of people. They don't even need to come to my office. I can employ them virtually, and I can service them. I can do shared services, whatever for them, but I don't pay them. This is probably the future. The future Everyone has to be an entrepreneur. And if you do not learn entrepreneurship, that means you create things. You have to become a job creator. And the number one job you create is for yourself. And then create jobs for other people. You cannot be a job seeker. And if you're not prepared for this, you're in trouble. So you say, mm, I think jobs would be not so difficult. La. I like my educational system. I have to say, maybe it's not true. Maybe there's no more jobs except the jobs that you created. Will you worry about this now?
wrong for everybody. Well, I guess, um, you know, one of my dreams actually when I was young to actually be an entrepreneur and create a job for myself. Um, but I guess like along the way, I was just thinking about entrepreneurship and I realized um, that entrepreneurship by creating jobs and like spearheading something requires a certain sense of like idealism and being able to dream. And I guess, um, yeah, and I guess that while, while, I dare to, while I want to dare to dream, at the same time, I also need to be grounded in reality. Yeah, so I think that's the present like predicament that I face and a lot of my friends face at the same time. So I don't think I can give you an answer right now about whether I want to go towards job creation. I think I still have to give it more thought. Yeah, but I admire those people who create their own jobs and, you know, and, and believe in and can take the first step. Because when people say having a job is safer than doing a business, then at 40 years old, your children are going to university, you have just bought a new car, you have some upgraded to a condo, and your job is gone. Because not that you not that the, the somebody took over your job, but the AI took over your job. Then your job is not safe. So today, an employment is actually not a safe thing. You know, just now there's one guy come from New New Pew. He's a this a garden garden uh, uh, guy, a horticulturist. He said, "I'm going to be so loyal to my staff." I think this kind of people very rare nowadays. They should say, anybody who cannot make me money will be fired. And it is actually like that. So if you don't create money, you are always fired. So the reality is that jobs are not safe. Entrepreneurship is safe. Why? Because you are the master of your destiny. If it didn't work, it's because you didn't do it, not because your boss decided that you don't have a job. Thank you, Jack. I think it's about staying relevant nowadays, isn't it? It's in, in the economy from now to the future. It's how you stay relevant with the changing times. And this is what we also bring to companies. We're seeing many organizations, in fact, top management, are trying to get people to stay relevant with the changing economy and the customer base. And with that, perhaps uh, I'll throw it to the floor, or we wait, okay. I do not disagree on the, on the responsibility of the school system. But as an expat who has been in Singapore for eight years, I got lucky to get married to a Singaporean, applying for my citizenship now, so Singapore is home now. And uh, I deal with business leaders and HR heads every single day. And when we talk about talent and when they look for talent, the first requirement that they have is that it should be from Singapore. So we have this preconception that we only bring expats to Singapore. There is not even one conversation that I have had that they don't say, I want the person to be from Singapore for several reasons. Now, when that escalates to be from someone from abroad, there are a few reasons for that. And one, and it's because Singapore is just too damn good. So when we have our kids, we love to travel. Singaporeans love to travel, but it's still rare to see Singaporeans living abroad or spending three, four years. Ab Maybe in Canada, you see some in Canada, but it's not the norm for Singapore. And when we are dealing with those MNCs, the problem is they don't have the international experience. They have hold maybe regional jobs and, and regional jobs, but they haven't lived abroad and they haven't really understood our culture to come over here. And in fact, when I'm interviewing executives from Singapore, they ask, oh, do I need to move? And when they answer to that, it's yes. They start thinking, oh, but my kids, and here in Singapore is so good. So I want to throw back to Jack as a question is, do you think this is also a strong component why we don't see as many Singaporean talents as the CEOs of companies, as the SVPs of companies, of some companies, of course? Do you think that's one of the reasons, Jack? 
I think that you are uh, referring to the people who are qualified. And you probably only meet the people who are qualified. Then you choose in between the people who are qualified. So you live in a world where the people who are qualified meet you, but the rest you're not interested to meet them. But as a country, you will find that you have to build everybody. Like this new coming, incoming Prime Minister said, nobody left behind. But if you want nobody left behind, you have to start at kindergarten to make their brain totally open. Yeah? And then they start to question, like Jewish system, before the kids go to school, you ask the child, what are you going to ask question to the teacher? And when the teacher cannot answer your question, the teacher is so happy. He says, I got students smarter than me. The rabbi will go and boast to every other rabbi that she's got very smart students. Here, if the teacher don't know how to answer you, you feel very insulted. So the system itself produces a problem. Okay? Now, if you were to say, um, finding talent from outside, there is nothing wrong with finding talent from outside. If you are short, you must find because you have to do your business. It is not local against foreign. It is the educational system that don't produce the supply. And it is a supply problem. Now, the demand will keep on coming back. If there's no supply, what they will do? They will move to another country and that our economy will not be strong because only the homegrown are cheaper, right? Imported things have import duty, right? So, I think we still have to focus on producing our own while we bring in talent from outside. Thank you, Jack. I'll pass on to Suna. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Gobi, Jack, and Emma. Thank you.